Tomorrow morning, we must warn the planet ship of the mutiny. What mutiny? The one that you're going to pretend is in the works, like your life depended on it. Because it does. If the worker revolt takes place, my informants tell me that the first order of business is to separate you from your head. Which is why there will be no revolt. I am authorizing you to use whatever means necessary to prevent it. Well, the best way to stop it is to increase profits and stop cutting the workers' pay. Production equals profits. What's up, everybody? This triple feature in the year 2000 is what we're talking about now, the top five films of the year 2000. If you follow me through the 90s, I'm about to take you on a whole other journey. And this time I may lead you completely astray because there's so many films we get into the 2000s that are so great. This is kind of the pinnacle time for me when I started watching movies at 18 years old. I really dug in here. We're talking Hollywood video, baby. Hollywood video, blockbuster sometimes, but Hollywood video was the one that I went to. And I was renting basically three, four movies at a time. Go home, watch the movies in one to two days, and then take back and get more movies. I was so excited that I was able to, uh, at that age, I had money, and I was able to actually just rent anything I wanted, able to see anything I wanted, and I started to be able to see some great films. Also saw some crappy films, some really terrible films. They're movies that I had always you know, waited for, and I finally got a chance to see it, and I was like, oh my gosh, what a letdown. But these are the top five films of the year 2000 that I saw. Now, again, a lot of these are the years, but especially when you start getting in the 2000s, I start getting a little bit iffy on what I'm choosing because it becomes a really tough choice. But number five comes actually from a film I just saw recently. Um, comes all the way from South Korea from director Park Chan-wook. This movie is about the actual line, the actual borderline between North Korea and South Korea. So uh, there's actually, this, uh, I mean, oh, look, guys, there's obviously some tension. Um, you know, who's good? Who's bad? Who knows? Is North Korea bad? Who really knows? We know the leader has a great haircut. We know he's got a great body. And we know he wants the best for his people. Does the media say he's bad? Yes. They say he's mad because he, you know, kills his own uncle or maybe his own brother or starves his people. But who are we to judge right and wrong when it comes to this and this movie really just shows there's this line and you have two different sides and something happens in the middle of the night at one time where a bunch of people are murdered so this is causing a possible war and they're bringing in people from the outside to be able to figure out exactly what actually occurred this number five movie again joint security area this the name, I remember reading, when I read the name, I was like, this movie looks terrible. It looks stupid. And when I watched the beginning of the movie, I was like, is this direct video Because the first few actors that actually show up are actually, uh, they're not from Korea. and But then again, their first language is definitely not English. And so it seemed like almost like a Steven Seagal film. But the second the movie actually gets going, we actually get into the characters. We start to delve into the mystery. You start realizing you're dealing with a special film. Both a film with uh, a lot of feeling, a lot of sadness, and a lot of mystery. And it builds as it goes. And this is definitely worth watching. So check this movie out. Number four film of 2000. First time I saw this movie, I didn't really th actually think it was that funny. And I'm not quite sure why I didn't think it was that funny. It was only a couple different parts. And then I happened to watch it again. And this movie really, well, one, it does the awkward humor, which I think, you know, obviously can actually work and spawn a bunch of sequels, which I just didn't care near as much about. But you have the awkward humor, of course. And then also one of the things it uses, which I think, I don't know why movies don't use this more in humor, but it uses that background thing where someone's saying something in the background of a crowd or they're just saying something in the back, just kind of, you know, where you can barely hear it out the back. And, and, and I don't know why for me it always absolutely works. But this, but this movie, number four, stars Ben Stiller and it stars Robert De Niro and it is Meet the Parents. This is a, a, a comedy that I think holds up absolutely well I mean, it's been 21 years later and this movie i think is still really good you have meet the fockers and all these the, the, the sequels they did which not that they weren't funny but this original one again like i was saying like it follows this, the, the awkwardness of this meeting of um 
he wants to ask his, you know, girlfriend to marry him. He wants to get the okay from the parents. And Robert De Niro does a beautiful job of playing this ex-CIA agent who uh, claims he's, you know, he's, that that's not what he was. And so he actually just interrogates the crap out of Ben Stiller and Ben Stiller, everything being absolutely awkward. And um, I guess I, mean, I, I know some people don't think this movie is very funny, but I think it's far and few between. So check this movie out. Number four, Meet the Parents. I got your chair, Greg. Yes, Thank you. Serious. Thanks. So you didn't want to go for the MD? No, I actually thought about becoming a doctor, but I decided it wasn't for me. Oh, thanks. Just as well. Boards are killer. Actually, Greg aced his MCAT. Oh. You serious? No, I did okay. Oh, he did more than okay. Trust me. Why did you take the test if you weren't planning on going to med school? Number three movie of 2000. I, I, I guess in a sense you could say this is a rehash of the director's first film. I mean, it's very, very similar. It's just a way better version. So it's kind of interesting. And he's gone on to his work has kind of gone all over the place. Um, even for the point that in his life he married Madonna for a bit. But this number two film is called, you know, how do I, say? I feel like I'm cussing or saying something dirty. That's not what I'm doing. Number two is Snatch. This movie stars, well, it's not actually from America. That's what's crazy about it. Can you believe that? I feel like that just proves um, how what an amazing person I am that I'm actually picking a film not even actually from the United States, it being Snatch. But Brad Pitt is actually in the movie. He's not like a, a main, main person, but Jason Statham is actually in this movie. This is directed by Guy Ritchie, which he's gone on to do, you know, a lot of bigger name things like Sherlock Holmes. And he recently just put out a movie called The Wrath of Man. Um, he's done a bunch of different stuff. He also did a movie, which I have never seen. It was supposed to be the worst ever with Madonna called Swept Away. But Snatch tells a story basically of everybody's there's overlapping stores and, and stories. And they're in search of this stolen diamond. And it's a comedy. It's a kind of a kind of a gangster film it jumps around to a bunch of different stuff it's hard to express why this movie is so good but it does the writing is absolutely beautiful and i don't think you can say that uh, guy ritchie ever did anything better at least that i've ever seen nothing close to this this was kind of the height i feel like his second film it was the height of everything he did so go check that out That does not look like a bookies. What have we stopped here for? What's the matter with that space over there? It's too tight. Too tight? You can land a jump. The number two film of the 2000s. This again comes from a uh, amazing director. It was his second film. I already had in the 90s. I had the movie Pie popped up. That was a low budget uh, black and white film. The second film, this movie's a killer. This movie will kill your soul. Uh, it, it's part of the reason I, because most films can try to do that. They can attempt it. They just can't. They can try to be so sad and so depressing and all these different things. And they just can't do it. But this movie, number two, is Requiem for a Dream it's from Darren Aronofsky. It tells the story of drug addicts. Basically, what you're watching, you're basically watching, you know, Jared Leto, who's you know obviously a super handsome man, but you're watching him, uh, Jennifer Connelly, um, you know, one of the Wayans brothers, of course, that's a given, one of the Wayans brothers, um, but they're drug addicts and they're dealing with their drug addict life, and they're trying to overcome this, and you're watching them spiral out of control, and you're also watching uh, Jared Leto's mom at the same time, her spiral out of control, and all these things from drugs, and so. It's showing this dr drug use. Now, from a person like myself, that drugs on that kind of level has just never really interested me. Uh, it always just seems scary and sad. I just never call. But other people, obviously, it really calls to. And this film, I feel like by the end, is a great PSA of what not to do. But this movie is made so beautifully, it's hard to explain. And the last scenes are just on spot but i remember when the first time it ended and i couldn't even express how depressed i was for like two days so this is not a movie you're going to want to watch if you're looking for any kind of good time this is the kind of movie 
if you want to, you know, show some really inappropriate stuff to your kids, but also want to scare your kids out of doing drugs. If you don't just want to show somebody, you know, cracking an egg and, you know, saying, I watched you, dad, I learned it from you. Um, then this is the movie to watch. What he says, you're coming up quick, kid. Thanks, man. He says you're smart, you're loyal, and you're not a junkie. Number one of the year 2000. Man, um, what do I say about this movie? This movie, when I first saw it in theaters, I went downtown, downtown Portland, to be able to go to the Fox Tower, which at the time they only showed really just like independent films. They showed films you couldn't see in the regular theater, or they maybe they would show up in the regular theater if they did well there first. It was that kind of film. It's where they showed like Napoleon Dynamite right at first when nobody had heard of it. And then once it hit there, it moved on. I saw Mulholland Drive there. Um, the, this movie was the first movie of all time. Well, the first full length, fully full length film by Christopher Nolan. Number one is Memento. Now, I think this is the best Christopher Nolan film ever made, still. I think this is, the, I still think not. I love Christopher Nolan. I just think this is the greatest murder mystery ever made. It's about a man that cannot remember anything after his wife died. He knows she was murdered and he's trying to solve it. So, but the movie also is told completely backwards. It goes jump forward 10 minutes and then jump back and then tell you the previous 10 minutes, then the previous 10 minutes, the previous 10 minutes. And so you're, t you're unraveling a story and you're out. Of, you can't follow things the same way he can't follow things. He's constantly waking up. And the only thing he remembers is his wife died. He knows he looks at himself and he's tattooed. And on the tattoos, he actually sees like, oh, John G murdered my wife. And he has all these like dates and addresses and different things to keep looking. So he keeps searching. And as you're watching this, you're watching other people around him. Like, Are they taking advantage of him? Are they helping him? How close is he to finding this? Why did he do this? Why did he do that? And you're just also solving why he himself is doing things. So you see it from the beginning. You see some stuff he did. You go, how did he get to this point? How did he solve this? How did he get here? What did he do before? And so there's this constant mystery and building up. When I first saw this film, I went to bed at night and I dreamt like the way the movie was going backwards. It was driving me insane. It was so stuck in my head. I only saw this because I happened to just open up the, you know, the Oregonian at the time, big Portland paper at the time. And I saw a review of it. And I was like, what is this? And it had a really good review on it. They gave it four stars. They only had four out of four stars. And uh, I read about the thing and I was like very intrigued by it. And so I went down there with my cousin and uh, his wife and we were able to watch it. And it just stuck with me and it still sticks with me. I don't. I just don't think Nolan's done anything better. But I don't. But that's not. Again, it's not disrespectful because it's so. How do you do something better than this? I know some people don't have it so high, but I don't understand. I know he's done stuff more ambitious. That's not a question. But this film is the money, baby. This is the film to see. Memento. Check it out. Thank you for watching. We'll be back with two thousand one top five films. Thank you very much. The bits and pieces you never bothered to put into words. And you can feel these extreme moments, even if you don't want to. You put these together and you get the feel of a person. Enough to know how much you miss them. And how much you hate the person who took them away. I, um, I added an address in here. It might be useful. It's an abandoned place outside of town. Um, a guy I knew used to do bigger deals there. It's isolated.